So before I begin, I'd like to welcome all the devotees. Thank you all for coming. Just by seeing all of you, I'm feeling really happy. <laughs> so thank you. Yeah, so this weekend, we're leading up to uh, the appearance of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Sri Ramchandra. His official appearance day is this weekend on the 13th, Saturday. And so we wanted to make this particular gathering somewhat both spiritual and what we say um, life strengthening in our own life. And therefore, we, we chose a particular title, The Art of Triumphing Over Life's Battles, uh, going deeper into the uh, teachings of the life of Lord Ram to help us extract deeper meaning in our own struggles to live in this world and to grow, both spiritually and morally, materially also. So um, we're going to center our presentations around some of the intricate themes that are pretty much permeate, permeated throughout the Ramayana. Om Agyan Timirandasya Gena Jana Salakaya Chaksu Unmilitam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Shri Chaitanya Mano Bistam Staptitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadamayam Dadati Swam Padanti Kam Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Sivasari Ghor Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hmm. So, Ram and the Ramayan, both. Ram is the Supreme Personality of Godhead, but as the ideal person who has all good qualities, immense character in terms of how he relates to each and every person he deals with and how he plays both the role of an ideal person who's righteous, moral, kind, self-sacrificing, humble, free from all bad qualities and at the, at the same time the powerful Supreme Lord himself who exhibits his mission by destroying evil in the world. The Ramayana is amazing. It stands supreme amongst the epics of spiritual literature in the world in the sense that it, uh, it it's two, two million years ago, actually, Lord Ram appeared. And still, throughout the world in different places, especially in the Asian world, there are so many descriptions of that particular narration that goes on with different titles and different headings, all focusing on the ideal person, Sri Ram. So hopefully we want to explore deeper. Um, I'll be speaking about two or three different times on certain principles that are outstanding within the Ramayana, which I think are um, uh, fundamental to help us understand deeper how to overcome and how to develop those qualities that give us the strength to understand and overcome life struggles. I think the biggest struggle in life that we have is relationships. <laughs> because why is it the biggest? Because it's the, it's the perfection of life. As we develop wonderful relationships, perfect relationships, ideal relationships, friendly relationships, loving relationships with others, our life is glorious. It's not so much about how much we have or what skills we have. It's about what is our relationship with God, what is our relationship with this material energy, which is God's functional energy to carry out the affairs of this world, and what is our relationship with all living entities, not just humans, but living entities in all species of life. So there's where Ramayan goes deep. It's both spiritual and ethical. 
ethical in the sense that it has all those qualities we want to develop played out in the characters that, that make up the Ramayana in such a dynamic way that you see both sides. You see what is not and you see what is. You see how evil, good triumph, triumphants over evil and how persons who have every reason to be selfish, greedy, and what we say, exploitive, become so selfless and so caring and kind to others. And then you see the opposite, when those who have no reason to be, explo uh, to be uh, exploitive, having everything in, the, in life and yet are never happy in exploiting others. The Ramayana's amazing. From one particular episode within the Ramayana to another, you find these dynamics, and it's amazing how it is played out. So we want to, myself, Buddha Bhavana, and of course Janaki Nath, we're gonna try and hit on some of these essential principles, and hopefully we'll be able to take away something that we can say that it was uh, character building, life changing. Because that's what Ramayana is all about. It's life changing. It's really, really the foundation for everything you want to think of in terms of an ideal person. Narada Muni, he's speaking, he's with his disciple Valmiki Muni. Valmiki Muni turns to Narada Muni and says, My dear Narada, is there a person anywhere ever existing that is kind, powerful, uh, without any personal motivation, uh, and never influenced by anger, treats enemies and foe equally, who who is selfless, self-sacrificing, can always feel what we say safe and powerful in each and every situation. He's describing so many of the ideal qualities of an, an ideal person. Narada Muni's listening. Narada Muni starts to go into deep thought, thinking about that person he's describing. Well, Mickey Moody doesn't know who he's talking about, but Narada does. Because Narada knows about the Supreme Personality of God, Sri Ram. So as he's describing all these ideal qualities, Narada's going into ecstasy. He goes into an internal, and he can't speak because his emotions are too strong. And in order enough to, to explode these emotions, he's trying to hold them within but it becomes too much. He just, just all of a sudden, he just opens his heart up and says, yes, there is such a person, and soon you will know more about him, and he leaves. Valmiki Muni is an interesting person. He is the author of the Ramayana. What was his character before he became Valmiki Muni? He was something different, not only different, completely opposite. His name was Ratnakara. He was a cruel, vicious hunter who used to kill animals wholesale simply for his own livelihood and for the livelihood of his family. One day, while he was on his exploits of killing, Narada Muni comes. Now he recognizes this person is not an ordinary person. He looks like a great sage. So although he's got so many bad qualities, you might say, and is vicious, he still has this element of reverence for great souls. So he comes and he offers his respects to the great soul. Narada says, what are you doing? He says, I'm, I'm out making my livelihood. He says, why are you killing so many animals mercifully? Don't you know? He gets right to the point. He doesn't waste time. He says, don't you know that whatever pain you cause to others will come back to you? 
you're going to suffer for every little bit of pain that you've caused to all these animals. And because you've been doing it for practically your whole life, you're going to be living in hell. Gets right to the point. Doesn't waste time. <laughs> doesn't tell them, you know, you know. Doesn't start patronizing. And he says that, you know, and because you're trying to take care of your family by doing these things, they will also have to read the results. Now, you should go to them and say that because you are doing it on their behalf, are they willing to take the reactions of your, your sinful activities too? So he does. He goes to his family members. And he's, they say, it's all yours. <laughs> we don't want anything to do with it. You're doing the killing, and therefore, you know. So they're not willing to take any of it. And so he comes back, and he's devastated. He can't figure out what, what he should do next. And Arda Muni says, all right, there's a way out of it. That's called devotion. He said, I'm, I'm going to teach you how to worship the Supreme Lord in such a way that as you worship the Lord, gradually you'll be free from the reactions. But you have to give up your occupation. Ratnakara, he's willing to listen. He becomes changed. Why is he changed? Not only by the presence of a great soul, but because he knows he's going to suffer. <laughs> He's got the message clear. It's no doubt that Narada Muni, because of his purity, was able to explain it in such a way that he felt the pain already. So now, um, he says, well, what do I have to do? He says, simply you should chant the name of God. And his name is Rama. R-A-M-A. So, now he's a sinful person. He has no good qualities, at least you know, externally. And, he's, and therefore, in his attempt to try and chant the holy names of the Lord, he can't. He can't do it. The sound will not come out of his mouth. He can't do it. Although he's trying, it doesn't work. Nard is, in, Nard is intelligent. The quality of a great soul is knowing how to engage a person in such a way that they'll become inspired in their practice of devotional service. It doesn't work one way, try another way. So he's thinking, okay, he can't chant the name of Rama, but he's always around death. So the name for death is Mara, which is the same letters. It's R-A-M-A, -A, but it's M-A-R-A. -A. So he says, now you chant the name Mara. And then he leaves. So now he's chanting, he's chanting Mara, 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 And gradually after some time, he's actually chanting Rama. And then... After chanting Rama for some time, he goes into a deep trance and uh, meditating on the name of Rama while chanting. And he sits in a lotus position and he's absorbed. And he's doing it for thousands of years. While he's doing it, he's completely oblivious to what's happening around him. And all the an uh, ants in the area decide to come all over his body. So he's like covered with these ants and you can't see him anymore. He's inside this ant hill and he's chanting in deep meditation, completely unaffected by the fact that he's surrounded by these insects. Narda decides to come back after some time and he hears this sound, Rama, 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 Rama. It's a beautiful sound. He's thinking, where's it coming from? There's an ant hill here, but there's nobody around. And then he looks, then he realizes inside the anthill is that sound. And so he goes and he starts pushing the ants away. And when the ants are pushed away, here's his personality, completely absorbed, sitting in the lotus position, chanting the name Rama, 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 Rama. So Narada gives him a name, Valmiki, means the sage who comes from an anthill. <laughs> That's the actual <laughs> meaning of the name Valmiki. 
So now, now he's, a, he's actually a great sage, chanting the names, and all for, after some time he becomes, what we say, very, very known as a great sage, and many persons come and take shelter of him, and he becomes a guru. One day, he decides, every day he goes to the Ganga for bathing, but this day he decided, I'm not going to go to the Ganga today for my bath, I'm going to go to the Thomas River. There's a river that's not, that's in that area called the Thomas. For whatever reason, he never goes to Thomas River, he always goes to the Ganga. This day he decided to go to the Thomas River. His disciple, Bhardaraj, very dutiful, they come, they go together. He's there and he's about to take his bath, but he sees something very interesting. There's a tree there, and in the tree there's two birds. One male, one female. And these birds, they look like a crane, but they're called crancha birds, crancha birds. And these birds are unique. When they connect with the partner, they make that partner for life. If one of the birds dies, that bird doesn't go find another partner. Very interesting. Good lesson to learn for us. Huh? No divorce, no separation. <laughs> These birds are so dedicated to each other as husband and wife, male and female relationship, that they have such a sweet relationship amongst them. While he's looking at these beautiful birds and thinking of the nice surrounding, all of a sudden something horrible happens. An arrow comes flying through the air and hits the male bird right in the chest, kills it instantly. And the, scream, the female bird starts to scream and she just can't, and she just flies away in misery. Valmiki Muni, he becomes so angry about this hunter, which he can't see, he saw the arrow, but he didn't see the person. So he, he, he utters a curse, and in that curse he says, because you have caused these two loving birds in the heat of their passion to be destroyed, you will suffer for many, many, many lifetimes. This is a curse he pronounced. And then, after pronouncing the curse, he starts to think, what did I say? Well, why is he thinking like that? Because he pronounced the curse in perfect Sanskrit meter with the perfect tune that was so beautifully chanted that although it was a curse, he becomes fascinated by it, by his own chanting of this, this, this mantra, and he can't get it out of his head. At first it becomes a source of anger, then he starts thinking, it's, now he's thinking, wow, what did I chant? That was nice. That was really beautiful. And then after a while, after becoming a little bemused, he becomes really happy. And the whole day, he's hearing his, the curse he chanted in his mind going on in perfect Sanskrit meter. And he's thinking, how is this? After some time, you know, he takes his bath, the curse, the mantra is still going on in his head. He can't get it out. You've had that situation sometimes. Sometimes we like that when it's the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra or something transcendental, but sometimes there's other sounds in there. <laughs> and we're trying to, you know, push them out. He can't even push this out. But at the same time, he doesn't want to. It just keeps resounding in his mind. He goes back to his ashram, and he's there, and then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, one day, Lord Brahma comes flying on his, on his uh, swan-like airplane, comes right to the ashram of Valmiki Muni, and comes up to Valmiki Muni and says, you know, you should write about 
the wonderful activities of Sri Ram. Therefore, because you have pronounced this meter so beautifully, make the verses about the life of Ram in that particular meter. And then he flies away. He just gives his instructions. Malviki Muni's thinking, Brahma, he never comes to this planet. It's hardly ever. And here he is visiting my ashram. And he's given me an instruction to glorify the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Sri Ram. And so now he understands the fact that it wasn't an accident I came to the Tamasa River. It wasn't an accident that I chanted this mantra perfectly. It was the will of the Supreme Lord. It was interesting. So now, he's thinking how to do it. Mm -hmm. So after some time, he had heard from Narada Muni. Narada Muni had actually delineated and narrated the entire life of Sri Ram. And Valmiki Muni listened completely. And after listening, he, perf he performed this um, presentation in this perfect, beautiful meter, 24,000 verses. Or Mayan makes up 24,000 verses. Of which the, the first, not the first two, but from verse number 8 to verse number 100, 92 verses is the essence of the teachings of Sri Ram. And now, of course, now what, what is happening, of course, is Sita Devi is living at his ashram. And she has now had two children called Love and Kush. So now he understands everything. The, the, the wife of the Supreme Personality of Godhead has come to my ashram, Brahma's appearance, my chanting of this mantra in the form of a curse, I have been given this service by the Supreme Lord. So he writes these 24 verses, or speaks them actually, and later, and, and then he's thinking, we want to distribute this to the whole world. So he puts it to song according to that meter. But he's thinking, who can actually bring it out to the world? But then he's thinking, these two personalities who are actually the sons of Sita Devi, they are highly qualified. They have all good qualities. They're living at my ashram. And they don't even know who their father is. So he goes to them and starts to explain to them what he has written. And they become inspired. And in a very songful way, they take what he makes and makes it into a very so beautiful expression of melodious tunes. And then they start going everywhere and teaching. And they don't even know. They're glorifying their own father, who is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. They come to Ayodhya. Ram realizes he doesn't know they're his sons, but at the same time, they come and they want to enlighten the, the citizens of Ayodhya about this personality. And though they're starting to singing it, and then Ram gets interested in hearing it. <laughs> so he's, he's think, he knows what it is. It's his life. <laughs> and he, these two boys, he doesn't know they're actually his sons. So he's sitting up on his throne. All the citizens of, of Ayodhya come. And these two personalities are just narrating beautiful Sanskrit room, the whole Ramayana, the whole life of Sri Ram. Now Ram's listening, and he's sitting up on the throne. He's thinking, what am I doing up here? I want to sit down there with the rest of them. <laughs> so but he think, he's thinking that, but if I go down, they'll see me, and then they'll, 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 it'll break the meditation. So he's waiting, and then he sees everyone's absorbed, and he sneaks down and sits on the floor <laughs> with everyone else. So he's sitting on the floor and they're narrating how Ram actually took birth. And that is a beautiful story. And what led up to the birth of Ram? We'll get to that on Saturday. <laughs> so this, uh, this prelude to the Ramayan is just a little bit of an appetizer to what Ramayana is about. It is really, really, really more than just a spiritual treatise that has wonderful pastimes about the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Satam prasanga mamavirya samvido bhavanti ritkarna rasayana katha. 
that by hearing the glories of the Lord, the ear and the heart become attracted and the mind becomes purified and one becomes attracted to engaging in the Lord's service. It is, it is an immediate elixir of nectar that comes into the heart and mind. So this weekend we will try to speak as much as we can about some of the more uh, relevant aspects of Ramayana that may help us go deeper into our own process of bhakti. But still, even though we're engaged in bhakti, we have so many difficulties, right? We have so many obstacles. This material world is full of trials and tribulations. And I'm a devotee. Still, I have, tr I have difficulties. Because the intricacies of the, the more subtle aspects of the, of the principles of bhakti are understood very clearly ni and nicely in the Ramayana. Really nicely explained. And we'll see how, how love turns to hate and how, hate and how uh, greed turns into generosity, how people who are so close to each other become the greatest of all enemies, and how, how envy destroys relationships immediately. And so many powerful, really powerful messages in the Ramayana. But it's not only about the story. It teaches us, if, if by going deeper into these pastimes, we can see where we fit into in a personal way and how to derive that, these messages and apply them in our own life. Because life is all about developing qualities that are conducive to our relationship with the Supreme Personality of God. The more we develop those qualities that are, what we say, in the mode of goodness or even transcendent to the mode of goodness, the more our bhakti flourishes. So it's a, therefore, bhakti is more than just doing things. And bhakti is about developing personal character, personality, and relationships based on those things. And the Ramayana is full. The only problem is we don't have enough time to go through the whole Ramayana. We could stay here for, you know, for weeks because there are so many deep messages. And although we will hit on certain points, uh, Johnny Kinath has chosen to speak about Hanumanji. Uh, as the, because in that personality of Hanuman, you can learn uh, complete dedication to the Supreme Lord's service, despite the most difficult situations that one may be faced with, and how one overcomes difficulty by determined effort and attachment to the service. And uh, Bhutta Bhavana Prabhu, he'll be coming tomorrow, and he'll be giving two, two presentations on some of the life-changing message of the Ramayana. So tonight I just wanted to give you a little, what we say, uh, what we say uh, appetizer. <laughs> Hopefully that will uh, expand itself into more and more of uh, a taste for hearing uh, the life activities of Sri Ram and many of his wonderful, what we say, associates and personalities. So it is about 9.15 and we'll, maybe we'll, we'll stop very soon and uh, then we'll have Kirtan. Uh, we have Sri Kala. He's come all the way from America personally, on his own, just to be here with all the devotees. And I'm so happy he came. It's been such a long time since we've been together. Uh, I know him for the last 20 years now, right? Almost? Almost 20 years now. Yeah, I think we only met about three times in the last 20 years. <laughs> We're always on different ends of the world. So he's come, and he's also going to present Krishna consciousness in a musical way that is quite unique and very creative. So that'll also be part of the program for the weekend. And uh, tonight he'll lead us into some bhajans. So without any further ado, um, I'll stop here. And uh, unless someone has a burning question, we can go on to the kirtan. Any comments or questions before we 
chant and dance. Okay, that's good. <laughs> so thank you very much. And Hare Krishna, Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Yeah.